Hey everybody, welcome to Open Door Philosophy. It's this podcast we do that's about philosophy, that we hope it's uh, really good for people who aren't that familiar with philosophy. I'm Andrew's former philosophy teacher, Derek Parsons. And I'm Mr. Parsons' former philosophy student, Andrew Graziano. Welcome to episode 34, where we begin a long-awaited five-part series on the philosophy of religion. Today we'll discuss the scope of this particular branch of philosophy, then a generalist discussion on the nature of God. But before we do that, Mr. Parsons, how's it been going? It's been going great, Andrew. I'm going to, uh, we're going to pretend that it's the middle of summer now. Let's project ourselves. You see, our good friend, Mr. Andrew Graziano, is leaving the country to do research, and we feel very sad for him. This is going to <laughs> Europe. So we're recording this a few weeks in advance. Uh, so I'm going to project myself into the future, and I see that I am in Colorado, and I'm having a wonderful time looking at the beautiful mountains and rivers and streams because it is probably late June. <laughs> so I'm having a great time. Uh, but current me is also having a great time uh, because there is two days of school left with students. And so this all uh, this whole week is going to be, man, emotional, super happy, but also super sad kind of goodbyes. And uh, it'll all end with graduation. And, uh, and that's a cool time, too. So anyway, a, a big yeah. week, really. So that's that's what's going on in my life. How about you? How's future Andrew enjoying uh, Italy? Well, I'm assuming hopefully, like hopefully it'll all go well. Hopefully I don't get robbed or anything. Uh, so <laughs> hope, hopefully I'll come back and in one uh, piece. Hopefully be back in one piece and uh, have a nice tan or something. I don't know. I don't really know what the weather like is over there. Well, but in Florence, it's hot. Is it hot? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. So I'm excited. Well, I guess I'll be excited from that coming back. Houston weather will probably be the same. So I guess Houston will be very hot as our weekly weather report goes. I don't think I have anything else exciting in June like you with the uh, nice rivers and stuff. So that, but I was going to ask, how did IB testing end up? I know that's a big that's a big thing oh for you, especially. The last exam was a uh, day and a half ago. It's three straight weeks of exams, and I'm glad it's over. Uh, I'm glad it's over for the students, because as <laughs> as wicked long as it seems for me, it is far more grueling for them. But I will tell you, uh, sitting in silence and looking at students for hours on end does create a particular type of fatigue, and <laughs> Just too much time in my head, you know. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I I do not. I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's better for for students or better for you. To be honest, because at least what I remember, I I the, those three hours go by super quick. But for you, it's probably really feeling every minute of that, right? So they, they do. It does take a while sometimes. But I just want to make sure I do a good job for the for the students. Like want to make sure they have everything they need and it's uh, the exams operate or function as, as they should and everything is calm and right and orderly so that they can focus on what they need to do. And, and I think that was accomplished. So I'm happy that that's how it was and I'm happy that it's over. <laughs> yeah. You do seem, uh, not from your voice, but from your, for people who you can't see us, but Mr. Parsons does look like he he just got done with like fighting a war or something. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I don't look like hell this morning. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, there's a freshness to me. I think <laughs> the ba the bags under the eyes aren't quite so heavy. <laughs> Philosophy of religion. Uh, I'm going to speak for Andrew when I say that we have been looking forward to this for a very long time. And it's stunning that it's taken us 34 episodes to get to it. Frankly, yep. we both enjoy philosophy of religion quite a lot. Uh, I teach it in my class. Andrew took it in college as well. And it's something that we find really intriguing for us, both personally and philosophically. So uh, I, I'm going to guess like the reason it took us so long is because uh, we knew it would be a big project. 
I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, <laughs> that I think right? that's right. I think that's totally right. I I was just thinking when you were saying that, I'm surprised this wasn't like our first series or something, but I think it's two things. Probably first, it's like, yeah, this is going to take at least five episodes, if not longer, but we won't have time for it. And I so I think that was a, a big part of it. And I also think that uh, philosophy of religion requires some, I think it requires a little bit of background into philosophy. So we're going to make it as accessible as we can, but I think uh, having these past 34 episodes is going to be a big help too. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And we've said it's five episodes. Those five episodes will not include everything that's mm-hmm. in the scope of no way. philosophy of religion. So very quickly, let me say what we are going to cover in these five episodes. I'm not going to necessarily attach these topics with episode numbers, but here's the topics like I said, today in the introduction, we're going to talk about just concepts of like, what is God, like the nature of God. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a number of different arguments that have to do with what we might call proofs of God, proofs of God's existence. So those would be like ontological arguments or arguments from definition. We're going to talk about cosmological arguments, which deal with like the origins of the universe. We're going to talk about design arguments, which has to do with the beauty, if you will, the intricate nature of of existence and our universe and how that might prove a God. And then we're going to talk about, which is a pretty big one, uh, the problem of evil. You know, if God is all good and all loving, you know, the old the old philosophical question, (laughs) you know, why does why does suffering exist? Why does evil exist? We're going to hit that as well. So. You know, th- things we're not hitting, you know, is things like uh, miracles, you know, verification and, and all of that kind of stuff. We might, religious experience might weave its way into some of these conversations, but religious experience is its own sort of category, religious language, things like that we'll save for future episodes, I suppose. But that's that's what we'll be covering in the next five episodes. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that the next five episodes will lay a very good foundation for thinking about major problems in philosophy of religion. So you're getting the fundamental layer. So get us going, Andrew. What is philosophy of religion? What does it (laughs) involve? What does it not involve? Kind of like, what is the scope of this particular branch of philosophy? A very simple question. I think (laughs) like much of philosophy, when dealing with definitions, it's going to really emerge out of, and this might be dumb, but I think it's, it's true. It's going to, the answer to this question is going to emerge after we look at uh, fields that encompass it, which is kind of a cop out answer. But I think philosophy of religion, at least in Western philosophy, deals at least what I have studied and I believe what Mr. Parsons also considers in this mostly is um, thinking about a theistic God, which leads itself to a lot of thinking about logic. And the reason I mention that is a lot of these arguments that we're going to be thinking about deal with uh, logical premises, which sounds a lot more complicated than it will be. Another big part of philosophy of religion is trying to know not what a religion encompasses, for instance. We're not necessarily going to be studying, you know, is it right that there's a pope? Is it right that we're reading religious scripture or something? And those do come up in philosophy of religion, but primarily it's concerned with thinking about God and the nature of God and the nature of religious experience for human beings. A big point of contention too is, uh, is it possible that we know God or that we can know God? Like I said, I'm not giving a huge definition of what philosophy of religion is, but really aspects which uh, philosophy of religion is concerned with. Do you have anything to add there? Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes in in trying to define something, it's also helpful to say what it's not. And you did that a bit, but some people might associate the word or think of the word theology, right? Mm. And that is a particular type of activity that thinkers do that employs the tools of philosophy, right? Philosophical reasoning and logic. But the difference between, say, like philosophy of religion and theology is that theology begins with the presupposition that God does exist. And for philosophy of religion, that is a question that's on the table. And so theology is also going to engage in things like, what is the Eucharist? Is uh, is God 
in the bread and is God in the wine or uh, or does the like transubstantiation does the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ as it's consumed or or is it just simply symbolic or also like other things you know arguments like about the trinity exactly what is the trinity how can that work how can three be one and and things like that those are theological questions and certainly like i said the the tools of philosophy are employed to answer and deal with those questions but again those are like very specific to in this case christianity and that's not really what philosophy of religion deals with it's more so what what andrew said so this isn't going to be theology we're not quoting book a chapter and verse from the bible or the <laughs> quran or anything like that it's going to be dealing with larger broader issues of god and, and can we know god and what let, you know what can we know and not know i guess another thing that's kind of interesting to point out and maybe Andrew might have something to say about this, is uh, as a discipline, or rather as a branch of philosophy, it's only been around for about 300 years. Religion has always been just sort of a part of philosophy. And only, like I guess, after the, the Enlightenment uh, did it sort of break out as a, as a branch of its own. Very similar to how like natural philosophy became what today we call the disciplines of science, and there's multiple branches of science. And so while biology is can certainly be considered a part of the philosophy of science religion and theology and its aspects are its own separate thing and philosophy of religion sort of broke away from i guess just the larger conception of philosophy oh well you have anything to say about that yeah i think that's a good point i would say probably in the just like you said in the 1700s when there's this enlightenment going on there's a less concern i think where these writers are considering if God exists. And so I think that's that's probably the big breakaway. If we're going to go and look back at older writers like very famous uh, St. Thomas Aquinas or uh, Augustine, or if you even want to go back to, which I was going to talk about, what I do think is interesting, a lot of Muslim theologians are very involved in uh, philosophy of religion or they're drawn on a lot biggest one I I can think of is Al-Ghazali, who devised one of the earliest cosmological arguments. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. So I think... And Kalam as well. The Kalam cosmological argument as well, also a Muslim source. Yeah. I think a lot of these uh, philosophy of religion as we think of it today as distinct from theology is a distinctive field. Uh, But if we're going back and we're looking at these uh, theologians and that's not just in the Christian sense, but in the three Abrahamic faiths, they're going to be considering some of these arguments in a very early way, of course, but uh, 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 since the beginning of, of all of their religions. But they're also going to be considering questions of theology. And so, like Mr. Parsons said, I think that this, the field does really separate, but we are going to be drawing, when we're talking about all of these arguments, from an ancient past, or an, or an older past at least. Let's, kind of, let's, let's throw out some, some names real quick of who we'll probably be talking long about. So, you know, you mentioned Augustine, uh, St. Thomas, you cannot escape St. Thomas Aquinas when talking about philosophy of religion. Yeah, there's some Jewish and there's some uh, Islamic uh, sources as well. You mentioned two of them already. A, another famous Jewish is uh, Maimonides. Mm-hmm. And then there's also Avicenna, uh, which discussed like the separation of the mind from the body, which really Descartes draws a lot upon. And then, uh, you know, in the modern sense, there's a lot of very active philosophy, religion philosophers as well. Like you cannot escape. I mean, you, like if you're involved in philosophy, of religion, you will have to grapple with Richard Swinburne uh, yep. without question. He's a giant in the field and or but Paul Tillich or, uh, you know, there's a lot of very uh, interesting uh, Dun Scotus uh, is another one. So I don't want to just keep rattling off names, but those are probably some names that will talk about and you notice that some of those do have the word saint in front of them so you know another good question is like oh well how can someone who's a you know a canonized saint you know be objective about talking about issues related to philosophy of religion but i think you'll see especially if you read you know like aquinas or something oh boy wow what a powerhouse um (laughs) philosophically speaking so Anyway, uh, I would call Aquinas kind of like the uh, the Plato or Socrates or Aristotle of the Middle Ages. Like, he oh is, yeah, oh he's for the sure, man. Yeah, <laughs> he's the power hitter. He's the Willie Mays or 
I don't I don't know baseball too well, but he's he's <laughs> the really giant of good. the field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even even Socrates too, right? Even Socrates mm-hmm. thought about uh I have, of course, you know, I have to mention Socrates uh, every of episode course. at least one time. No, of uh, course, like uh, Aristotle wrote on the soul. Socrates and Plato certainly talked about the soul quite a lot. And their conceptions of reality uh, beyond this one is, is very influential in Christian development, you know, Platonic thought. So, yeah. I was just all... thinking of even like youth, the Euthyphro dialogue, which I mm-hmm. think we might even talk about in, in this episode a little later, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. And I guess the last thing to say about scope is that, for better or worse, this is just the way it is. You know, if you begin reading a lot of philosophy, religion related things after this, you'll notice that it's incredibly Western. Philosophy of religion almost exclusively deals with Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. I I don't have a a reason for why that is. (laughs) There's lots of many other religions throughout the world, but philosophy of religion deals primarily with a theistic god which is a definition we'll talk about here in a little bit and a theistic god is the one that's associated with those three monotheistic religions that's just something to keep in mind if at some point you're like why aren't we talking about hinduism or you know the Taoist conception of god or something that's why and it's just what is i have no control over that i'm very sorry it's just the fact that a lot of philosophy of religion assumes like mr parsons said a theistic god and not well i can't i don't really know for a fact about all eastern religions i'm sure there's eastern religions i think would not consider themselves to be theistic right no they wouldn't well then let's let's just use that as a a jumping off point for the next topic and just talk about what do we mean when we say a theistic god what is theism what is a theistic god yeah, so that's the that's the really fundamental point in philosophy of religion that we have to we have to start with. And so a theist is going to think about God having three primary aspects. I've heard five as well, so we can we can talk about that, Mr. Parsons, too. But I've heard the three O's, triple A God, uh, all of these to describe <laughs> the triple yeah. A God. Yeah, it sounds like a uh, professional wrestler. <laughs> triple A. It's going to body slam you into eternity. <laughs> Sorry. Who says religion isn't funny? Uh, that was so serious. Anyway, God, the three aspects of God. God is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful. Triple A God. That's what, that's, what I've, that's what I've heard it as. And so those are three big aspects uh, that cause a lot of concern for atheists and I guess theists believe to be the fundamental definition of God, or at least a good starting place for God to make a lot of distinctions and to, uh, they use those three aspects to draw upon for sure, uh, to make a lot of logical thoughts about the nature of God as well too, uh, which is really interesting. Yeah. Swinburne, We'll talk more about the omni-attributes, not only in this episode, but as we go through all the different arguments for proofs of God. Yeah, Swinburne identifies three, omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly free. And he identifies other ones, such as omnibenevolent and omnipresent, but he says those flow from the big three, which is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly free. But either way, like all of those are wrapped up in the idea of a theistic God, right? A God that knows everything, a God that is all-powerful and a God that is all good and is perfectly free. So if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, you believe in a theistic God, according to that definition. And so that's what it concerns itself with. So outside of that, a person who is not one of those three religions I just mentioned, they might be wondering, well, why is philosophy of religion important for me? I'm a non-believer or I'm an agnostic and I just am not that invested in this. Like, uh, why does philosophy of religion matter, and and by extension, why does it matter for, say, the atheist? Yeah, fundamental point. For the theist and the atheist alike, really just for human beings, what one knows about one believes is incredibly important. This is something philosophers have emphasized the importance of for the past 2,500 years, and I think we 
normal humans have uh, really ignored their pleas and in return to this life of ignorance where we're just believing or we're not necessarily believing, but we're just, yeah, I guess we're just believing whatever we want without thinking about it and really having a valid reason for it. And that's kind of problematic, you know, because we base our decisions in how we interact with the world around what we believe. And so if we don't really have a good reason for believing something, really whatever that may be, not really just even related to God, we base our decisions on what we believe. And if those beliefs are flawed in some way or incorrect, then we're going to be making bad decisions. And like I said, this is not just about uh, philosophy of religion. This is literally about anything. This is a fundamental point in all of philosophy too. I can think of many instances in my life where I held a belief and I realized that that belief was wrong and that I uh, made decisions from that belief that were wrong. And it's, I think probably everyone has had that experience and it's just kind of a shameful feeling, you know? And so I think philosophy of religion operates the same way. Whether you're the theist, it's important for you to have some justification behind your belief. Yeah, one of the reasons I decided to teach philosophy of religion in the course that I teach is students in my class are primarily the age of 17 and 18, and it's generally about that time when humans have begun to have all kinds of questions about the nature of things, the nature of reality, existence, what is the purpose of life, and do many of the beliefs that I grew up with as a child that were instilled in me in a way not meant to manipulate in an honest way those ideas and beliefs you know do they do they hold up because there are always contradictions in everything that's involved in life there just is life is filled with contradictions and so the same holds true for religion there are many contradictions that a student will begin to see if they are a devout christian they'll see in the old testament a very angry and jealous God. And then in the New Testament, they'll see a God who's very loving. And they're like, well, that doesn't square up. You know, and so there's lots of questions that come out of that. And people begin to question their own beliefs. And I think it's important for students and and anyone, any human being to have, you know, the tools necessary to be able to grapple with those types of questions. So that's one of the reasons I always incorporated into the class that I teach. I think here too, I just want to put kind of a disclaimer in. Maybe disclaimer is not the right word. When I was thinking about this topic today uh, and looking at many of the questions we're going to be discussing, I think it's very easy when we're thinking about questions about God to hold beliefs about the topics very sensitive to us and hold them very dear and be unwilling to engage with the thoughts behind them. And I think that's That creates a lot of bad philosophizing when we're we're thinking about the nature of God, uh, either for or against, because I think there's this kind of reputation that's maybe deserved and maybe not of angry Christians or probably angry Christians, to be honest, just at least where I live, maybe irrationally putting uh, pamphlets in people's mailboxes or whatever. But I think like the same goes with atheists as well, too. So these are sensitive topics. And if we're not really engaging with them in a way that's appropriate for philosophy, then we're not really making any progress. And then this is kind of a pointless discussion. So there needs to be some kind of openness that we're going to be having from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. That that sensitivity comes from the fact that a person of one of the three Abrahamic faiths uh, takes on that faith as part of their identity. And so by questioning you know, the existence of God or talking about why suffering exists or talking about whether or not the universe is intelligently designed or not is not a question about a philosophical issue. It's a question about their personal identity. And it can certainly be perceived as, say, like an attack on them personally, which is why it's sensitive. So it's important always in philosophy and not just with philosophy of religion, but but anything you can be talking about issues of ethics and certainly something or personhood and certainly something like abortion can come up. It's important to like separate your identity from the idea that we're discussing. It's like take the idea out of your of your mind and sort of hold it out there to be able to to look at it and turn it and talk about it in a way that isn't 
indicative of any way of like who you are as a human being, as an individual person. So we're not talking about your identity, right? We're not talking about your faith in, in God. We're talking about the ideas that underlie uh, much of what belief is. I want to, before we move on, just to make a quick edit to what Mr. Parsons said, and I think he'll agree with me. Maybe not, but uh, <laughs> I think this is tr- I think this is true. I don't think it's just simple enough to say it's only a person of these Abrahamic faiths who's holding on to these beliefs. An atheist is holding on to beliefs just as well as the the Christian or the Jew or the Muslim. Um, an atheist believes in their disbelief, and I think that's also crucial to their identity as well. Um, I've met a lot of atheists who hold on to that idea uh, just as much as the crazy Christian too. No, that's a great point and a good segue to talk about what God is. If you've listened to the show long enough, you'll know that both Andrew and I believe in God. Andrew has said many times that he is Catholic. So it is, I guess, important to know that that is the perspective that we're coming from. But Andrew and I, even though we both claim to believe in a theistic God, what we think about that particular God, or rather our conception of God, is going to be different, which I think is something that's very interesting. So there is this notion in any of the faiths that, you know, we all go to church together, there's like hundreds of people sitting in there, and that we all believe in the same thing. But in reality, we really don't. I mean, in the general sense, we do. But what each individual person thinks and believes about God can be very different from the person sitting right next to them, even though they both claim to believe in a theistic God. So one of the things we want to talk about today is like, you know, exactly what is God? Like, what is the nature of God? Can God be known? I kind of think of this in a way of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein had this idea and it was related to linguistics, but he called it image theory, right? So like if I say apple, you know, immediately in Andrew's head, uh, an idea of an apple pops up, like he has an image of that in his head and, and I do too, but those apples can be very different, right? Like Andrew might be thinking of a Granny Smith and I might be thinking of a delicious red <laughs> and there's different sizes and shapes and Fuji apples and all kinds of things. And even though we're both thinking apple, we are thinking of different apples and you can use that for anything. You can say cats, dogs, trees, whatever, different things will pop up in each other's heads. And so it's very similar with God, right? When we say God, if you're sitting in, well, I don't know, a, a Baptist church, person sitting in the pew next to you might have a very different conception of God. And then if you even want to take it further, like say like a non-denominational evangelical Christian versus say like an Episcopalian also might think very differently about God, but both claim that they believe in the same God. It's a fantastic point. It definitely is quite different. And I think that's another reason why philosophers of religion uh, stick pretty tight to the triple A conception of God, because that's such a fundamental, necessarily agreed upon aspect of their God. So I think that's another reason why philosophers of religion are so adamant about using those three aspects. And they're just fundamental, they're necessary. You know, uh, uh, like Mr. Parson said, a Baptist and a Catholic are going to fundamentally disagree about a lot of things. And even more, the Baptist and the Jew and the Jew from the Muslim. And so those differences do create a lot of problems, but they also just looking at those aspects which they share in common is just so is so, so much more important. It's interesting too, like the more you try to, like when you mentioned, you know, a, a Christian, a Jew and a Muslim, their conceptions of God, and we all say that we believe in that same God, but their conceptions are incredibly different. It can sometimes with philosophy, religion, get to the point where God becomes so abstracted, trying to harmonize all those views that God ceases to have certain attributes. Like certainly there are people of the Christian tradition that believe in a very personal God, a God who knows you. The old saying like knows the hairs on your head, how many hairs are on your head uh, is involved intimately in, in your life. But then we begin talking about 
omni attributes and this all powerful God who is timeless and, you know, all these sort of things. And like, all of a sudden that God's not as personal anymore. Uh, we have a very sort of abstracted God. And so can God be those two thing, two things at the same time, right? A God who is so incredibly powerful and omnipresent that, and like completely orchestrates the universe, but at the same time, you know, knows that, uh, you know, your brother's been a pain in your butt. It's been hard for you to, uh, you know, keep your temper down or whatever. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those inherent contradictions, but, and I don't know if like, uh, the abstraction of God is necessarily a problem. I was just going to um, ask you that question. Oh, well, do you have an answer? <laughs> do you want me to answer that? <laughs> is it a problem? Um, I was thinking about this earlier, so that's why I wanted to talk about this. I don't think it is a problem. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. And I think here's why. It's very difficult for any person to know for certain anything. So <laughs> if I say, okay, I want to know Mr. Parsons, the way that I'm thinking about knowing Mr. Parsons is going to be different than, I don't know, one of his students or something. And that's not just saying like, okay, I want to know his personality or I want to know what he's like as a person or whatever. But that's not really what I mean. Knowing like what Mr. Parsons is in pretty much every sense of that question is extremely complicated. And then, okay, if, even if I'm thinking of something else that's even a tiny bit more abstract than you, say that I'm thinking of a circle too, right? That's a tiny bit more abstract than Mr. Parsons just because I can't necessarily physically interact with a circle in the same way I can with Mr. Parsons. If I'm trying to come to know what a circle is, that's extremely difficult. I can know aspects of that. I can know, okay, a circle has 360 degrees, kind of looks like this. But again, those are kind of aspects. They're not definitional of what a circle is. And so when we're thinking about God, is it a problem that God is so complex? It's so difficult to know what God is. I don't think so, because in the same way that it's difficult to know what Mr. Parsons is and know what a circle is, it's also difficult to know what God is. And I don't know if I can know any of those three things with certainty or even close to certainty at all. So is it a problem that God is so difficult to know? Is it a problem that Mr. Parsons is so difficult to know? Is it a problem that a circle is so difficult to know? I don't know, but I don't think that's necessarily a proof against or a proof for any of those things. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would not have thought about it from a proof aspect. But what you said is fan uh, really fantastic. Uh, it's true. Like, can we ever truly know anything uh, <laughs> on an intimate level? Whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a that's a really great point. Uh, and then in the way that you illustrated it, I mean, certainly God is a mystery to a degree. Uh, just yeah. as like maybe even your own spouse might be a mystery to you to uh, to some degree. And I guess that's the key phrase, right? To some degree. Can we know certain things about God? And and that's the omni attributes, right? Uh, which we'll get to here in a moment. And perhaps we can know those things. But, you know, it's so interesting when people will claim yeah. that, you know, they know the mind of God, which is yeah. like, Ooh, what? Like, <laughs> like, hold up there now. <laughs> like, can you know the mind of God? Well, geez, I mean, you can't know the I mind can't... of like the person sitting next to you. How are you going to know the mind of God? And so there's plenty of belief. No, I, I mean, I can't know the mind of a squirrel, right? <laughs> For God's right. sake, right? Like, right? Yeah. So anyone who makes those claims immediately, like, uh, you know, I, I get, I get, <laughs> I push back on that real fast. And well, I mean, and it's even supported not only biblically but philosophically. Like, you know, in the, at the end of Job, when Job has been uh, dealing with this really horrible situation of his life circumstances, and you know, his wife's like, "Curse God and die and get on with it." Finally, he questions God, and God shows up, and he's like, "Who are you?" Who do you think you are to even question who I am? Did you create the universe? No. And But so many other religious traditions, I think a Paul Tillich, the 20th century theistic existentialist, calls God the God above God. This God that we think we know is this God with all these omni attributes. But the reality of God is beyond those things because human reason can only go so far and God being omnipotent must be beyond that. And so how can we know God? Or you can go with like an Eastern tradition with Taoism. You know, the first poem in the Tao Te Ching is the Tao that can be known is not the eternal Tao. You can't know the Tao, which is very similar in a way, 
well, not similar in a way, but it is the underlying power uh, of the universe, the Tao. Like you can't know what that is. And so the Tao, Tao to Jing ends that first poem with say, the Tao is a mystery wrapped within mystery. So on one hand, we can know God, but on the other hand, by definition of God, we can't know God, like totally beyond us. Mic drop. <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think that's pretty a pretty awesome way of thinking about it. And I think, I don't know if this is appropriate, so feel free to cut this out, future Mr. Parsons. I always laugh when you say but... that when I'm editing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, here I am. <laughs> it's me, future Mr. Parsons. <laughs> How did Andrew know? Um... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it's really fascinating too. Like different traditions are going to have different answers too of of thinking about how we can know God and the extent to which we can know God as well. I think that's a big. I could be totally wrong about this. I am not the expert at this at all. But I think that's like a distinction between Catholics and and some Protestants. And I think that's just always really fascinating when I think about that. I don't know why. This is this might just be a personal conversation here too that you can cut out as well, but I think it's really cool. Religion kind of kept the embers of philosophy going for a long mm. time. And so Greek and, and I guess <laughs> Roman philosophy too, it was adopted by uh, Christians. And so I think a lot of these fields in philosophy of religion, we can see in modern philosophy, epistemology, metaphysics, logic, ethics, political philosophy, those are all uh, somewhat related to uh, uh, philosophy of religion as well, to be honest. And I, I don't know. I just think that's really cool. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, philosophy in the Middle Ages, whether we're talking about Spain or France or we're talking about the Middle East and Persia, all of it was very religious in nature for about a thousand years. And and of course, it is the uh, the Muslim scholars that help revive and secure Greco-Roman philosophy that eventually was picked back up again in Europe by Aquinas and others. So yeah, it's all very interconnected. So the Omni attributes, you've heard us talking a lot about them, or the triple A of the, <laughs> of the attributes, right? Andrew and I have both identified a couple of different lists, if you will. But one thing that's always involved in all of these lists is omnipotent and omniscient and freedom, as well as benevolence and a type of presence. So we want to talk about each one of those as we go along. I don't know that we'll totally string out each argument for for each one of these, because that's kind of some of the work of future episodes. But it's a, it's an important foundation, right, that most theistic philosophers or rather, most philosophers of religion will agree these are attributes of God in one way or another. So the first one is omnipotent, right? And that very simply means complete, total power, all-powerful, all-knowing, and can really do anything that God would like to do. But then that immediately brings up some questions, doesn't it? <laughs> can God do anything that God wants to do? But that's omnipotence, and that's the first one. And there are philosophers, I think, of um, Anselm says, uh, if, if you can think of something that is greater than God, then that thing must be God. So omnipotence uh, is, is like the foundational omni attribute. Anything to say about that? No, I think you brought up everything. I just want to, I think this is an important distinction. Uh, philosophers mm -hmm. like making distinctions. Uh, and I think it's especially important in philosophy of religion since it's so complex. When you say all powerful, we need to think about uh, mm -hmm. what kind of all powerful means. Does it mean, I guess this is the time for questions and not answers, but does that mean uh, God can right. do anything that he wants? Or does that mean that God can just do everything in his power yeah we'll, well talk about these later i do want to bring up it kind of fits in with all the omni attributes but one of the things that philosophers argue about in relation to this is if god is all-powerful can god do that which is logically impossible so the classic yeah. example is a square in a circle you know can god make a square circle that's kind of a silly thing to think about if god is all-powerful then you would think god would be able to do that but that's not logically 
possible. Like that doesn't fit in with the parameters of what we understand as possible within our universe. So then, you know, someone will come along and say like, well, God can't make a square circle. So therefore God is not all powerful. Is this a strong argument, Andrew? Yeah, I think the simplest, or I think this is the best example that I've heard of this. Uh, maybe not, but I, this one's really good. Can God make it rain mm-hmm. and not mm-hmm. rain at the same time in the same location in the same respect? I think the answer is no. I don't think that's a proof that God is not all powerful. And I think most mm-hmm. philosophers of religion agree with that. It's like this, I think philosophers who do make the claim that is a criticism and a proof that God is not all-powerful. I think it's a failure in distinction. All-powerful doesn't mean Mm -hmm. can bend the rules of logic. I think the problem there just lies in a matter of distinction personally, and I think that's probably what most philosophers would agree with. Yeah, no, no, you're you're right. But it's a great question to ask, and I'm just going to draw on my own experience as a child growing up in the church. And, and believing certain naive things that, that a child naturally would believe. If you tell me that God is all powerful, then I, as a child, I'd be like, oh, well, if God was a human being, does that mean he can fly? Or can God make a cat appear out of thin air? Something, you know, childlike in that way. That's outside of what's logically possible. Then that does get us into the realm of miracles, which is probably a whole nother. I don't even know if we're doing an episode on it, but you know, a, a yeah. miracle, I guess, kind of by definition is something that's outside of, uh, or, uh, not violates, but circumvents natural law. Although I don't think there's any examples of God making cats appear out of the ether, but you know, people would say something like, uh, you know, uh, curing cancer when it's in the you know, stage four or something like that you might have God intervene in, in a way such as that, that we would call a miracle. Just some other counter arguments to the whole uh, omnipotent thing and, and can God do what is logically impossible. But I side with you, you know, I, I, it sounds like in a way it restricts God, but I think God must operate within the laws of the universe, laws of uh, the universe that God created himself. And, you know, there's some other things you could think about there as well, too. Like, uh, is God actually uh, a part of the universe? One of the other omni qualities, omnipresent you get into this, like one of God's traits is that God is eternal. So does that mean God exists in this universe, therefore is subject to natural laws? Or does God exist outside of the universe in some way that has a whole different set of laws? I don't know where I'm going with this. These are just questions. (laughs) But they're good questions too. Important questions for all. I'm going to use this term. I don't know. I guess this is an acronym that I like. P.O.R.s, mm-hmm. philosophers of religion, that they think about. I think another popular response that I, I don't know how I feel about it, but I might have merit. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. But I think it's something to the extent of, well, God can operate outside the laws of logic. I think that one's interesting. I really can't fathom that. And I'm not saying that in like a good or bad way. Like I, I just, I don't think my mind or a human's mind has the uh, ability to comprehend something like that. I really can't think about something that can't operate logically. I don't know. Like, I have have no clue. Don't have the answer to that one. If nothing more, the last two or three minutes exemplifies some of the questions that immediately come up when you start thinking (laughs) about omni attributes. You know, my mind just starts reeling off questions. Suddenly, we're talking about whether or not God is in the universe or outside of the universe. Uh, not that, we- or if God can make cats appear out of nothing, you know. That's right. <laughs> what the heck would be outside of the universe? Uh, who knows? So then you get to these uh, these <laughs> these points where you just kind of stop. But again, it kind of exemplifies some of the questions that philosophers deal with when talking about traits of God. Omniscient is another one, and again, all these kind of link with each other. So omniscient is that. You literally know everything. So all-powerful means, uh, some philosophers of religion will just say, omnipotence is all you need. Everything flows from omnipotence. So this is kind of an argument with that, but but omniscience is that you know all. So if you're all-powerful, that means by extension, of course, you would know everything. And so if God knows everything, then we that sort of extends into um, omnipresent. You know, if God knows everything, does that mean that God knows the future? 
or does God know what can God know at that particular point in time? And there is some discussion about that. Swinburne believes, and he says he's outside of the mainstream on this one, but Swinburne believes that God only can know what God can know in that particular time. So, for example, God can know that in 524 BC in Athens, it snowed on May 22nd. God can know that because that has already happened. And God can know everything else that happened on that particular date all over the world simultaneously. But God cannot know what is going to happen the very next day after today. And his reasoning for that is because God gives us freedom. And that gets into free will arguments. But he says God can't know what is beyond. In other words, there is no destiny for us because we are free. But again, he says uh, that that's outside of the mainstream. Most philosophers of religion with the omniscient argument believes that God does know everything in all timelines. I'll give an example of a philosopher, what a philosopher might think if he thinks that uh, God does know everything, even in the future timelines. That would think God can see all the possible... Tr well, if I'll make this distinction here too. If God gave humans free will, I think they would believe that God can see all of these choices that people make and know all of the possibilities. Also has a, a knowledge of the past, like Mr. Parsons said. And then two, this is another... Dis well... I don't think this is necessarily a distinction, but we have to talk about this uh, omniscience not just as knowing what might occur and knowing what has occurred and knowing what is occurring, but also just having a knowledge of what is good, what is right. Theists would have to also believe that God is, is the greatest mathematician or something. God knows all of these math laws. This is just a very bad example. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm thinking of, I was reading Swinburne this morning. This is why it's all on my mind. I can't remember what it was. Uh, mathematicians would know. It was some particular math problem. He said that people have been trying to figure out for 300 years. And, you know, God knows the answer to that. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a, much, that's a better example than I was going to pull. But yeah, exactly. God would score uh, 1600 on his SATs all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's, maybe. He'd get admitted to all the colleges. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's sacrilegious to say. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, like God, not only is God knows, at least I think this is what we can, at least uh, theists would agree on. So I'm not going to say anything about the future, but God at least knows everything that is occurring and everything that has occurred and perhaps knows everything that will occur. Uh, but he's also the greatest mathematician ever to exist times like infinity or something like that. So that's, uh, that's what we mean by omniscience. Oh, it's, it's all just so super interesting uh, to me, these questions. That that, that kind of gets me to, if we want to really get kind of out there, if we're not already. Omnipresent, I think, is fascinating because then we start talking about like the nature of time and exactly what that means. So one of the traits of God is that God is eternal, right? So, But what exactly does that mean, right? So there's basically two views on that, the timelessness of God versus the everlasting nature of God. So there's one particular view, which is the timeless view, I think, I'm saying this one right, is that God is in all places at all times. In other words, we conceive of time as sort of this arrow going through space, right? And we can see what was before and what is present, and we do not know what is in the future, but we know that that future is coming. And once that future comes and passes us by, it is now in the past. So you have this linear conception of time. And there's one view that God is going along with humanity, if you will, going along the universe with humanity on this timeline as it's happening. But then there's another viewpoint, the everlasting viewpoint, where God is in all times simultaneously. So God is at one point present in 325 BC, but also is present in 2052 AD. <laughs> At the exact same time, God is in, in all places at all times. And so when you talk about omnipresent, you know, when I say like, you know, your God may be a little bit different than my God, this is kind of one of those deals. Is it important? I don't know. I don't know if that's actually important, knowing about God and time and where he's at. 
but uh but it's one of those it's one of those types of deals you know is is god interacting with you uh, in the present because god knows what's going to happen for you in another year from now um but you know if god knows what's going to happen to you a year from now then you're not free as swinburne says we are largely free to do what we want and most philosophers of religion uh, support that as well so anyway you, there's just some more of those uh, contradictions that come up with that. Do you ever think about the timeless nature of God, Andrew? <laughs> that's to be honest, that's not one of my that's not one of my big ones. And I wanted to. <laughs> I think this is a good. Uh, well, actually, I have something to wrap this up. It's necessary uh, to hit the other two, but this one, uh, this point in particular, always reminds me about what I'll say in about three or f- probably five minutes. Uh, so remember this in five minutes or so. Future us will be waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one is held by most theists or held by all theists, but it's it's one that raises a lot of controversy. I think uh, this one is that God is omnibenevolent. God is all loving. So I think this one is controversial primarily because some problems that we're going to be looking at in future weeks. But I think, you know, this is kind of what it sounds like. God loves all of his creations to the fullest extent of whatever love means. So think of like a, a, a true parent's love times infinity. And God cares about humans. And, and I think everything that he created, you would have to say, but I, I'm not sure, at least human beings to that fullest extent that he can yeah sure and so an all good god you know immediately the problems you were talking about is in philosophy of religion it's what's referred to as the problem of evil so you know why does suffering exist if god loves us why do people suffer why do bad things happen to good people i mean it's just the classic existential question you know why does it seem like people who are good and devout might get the short end of the stick while those who are scheming and conniving manage to rise to power and have great wealth and luxury and all this sort of stuff and it doesn't seem anything bad happens to them? So, oh, it's a huge problem. It's probably one of the biggest ones. One one I enjoy uh, talking about a lot, honestly. But that kind of links in with being perfectly free, right? So, the idea of if God is uh, omnipotent, that means God is also perfectly free, which might contradict the whole ideas of uh, can't countermander natural laws. But nonetheless, uh, God is perfectly free, meaning that God has a complete choice in what God decides to do. And if you follow that logic, a person who has perfect freedom would only choose to do that which is perfectly good. And that brings us to the omnibenevolence, right? So if God is perfectly free, God would do, by definition, God would do that which is perfectly good because all beings seek the good. And being perfectly free, he would seek the good and thus become omnibenevolent. But it also means, I guess, if he's perfectly free, he can, you know, smite a city or something. (laughs) There's a few stories about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I have anything else to add. I think uh, I just don't want him to smite our podcast. It'd be very bad. That would that would that would probably be not good. Hopefully not. But I wanted to say, if you recall, I wanted to say a few minutes ago. Yes, I wanted to say two things. Well, this the second thing just popped into my head, or or the first thing. I'll say this first. So these aspects of God, I guess they're pretty much agreed aspects of God by most theists to some extent. And I think theists use these to kind of create conceptions of God too, or reinforce conceptions of God, I would say probably is is more appropriate. So Mr. Parsons definitely alluded to this one earlier when he was talking about uh, Swinburne. Is that, am I pronouncing that correctly, Swinburne? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I think if God is like all powerful, there can't be a God more powerful than God. That's that's definitely one reason I think a lot of theists are going to be pretty compelled to say that there's only one God. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about some maybe some problems with that later. But I think that's like or that's one of the reasons that reinforces that idea. And then my second point that I was going to make, too, and this is kind of connected with this question that we were talking about earlier about knowing God. Can we know God? Can the nature of God be known? 
Um, it's like, okay, God, if we're a theist, is all powerful, all knowing, all loving, and perfectly free Th- for things, or in, in all present too, I guess. So five things that human beings all are not. Mm. And we have trouble knowing ourselves. We have uh, <laughs> more trouble knowing other people. We have trouble knowing what a squirrel is. We have trouble knowing like what a rock is and, 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 and things like that too. We have trouble operating uh, computers and, and phones and uh, in everything to that extent. Um, and these are all very finite things. And so I don't know if this is a problem, but I'd like to hear what you think about this, Mr. Parsons. If God is something that we are fundamentally not, how does this raise problems for us knowing what he is? It would mean that we have absolutely no way to relate to God whatsoever. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, this is just kind of where I'm at with God and my belief in God. It'd be quite a long story, and I've been just about all of it um, <laughs> at some point. An evangelical, hyper uh, intense teenage Christian. I've been, uh, you know, an agnostic very much so questioning. There was a point where I was very much so a hard materialist and didn't believe in God whatsoever. And, you know, I've come back around and and now I sort of believe that God exists. Uh, When people ask me, does God exist? Do do I believe there's a God? A student just asked me this the other day. So like I teach philosophy, right? Everyone, uh, students know this, but not all of them are in my class. I'm having this random conversation with a student waiting to take their, their uh, Spanish exam. And I, I barely know the student, right? So we're just sitting there waiting for it to start. You'll enjoy this, Andrew. The student said, so can you tell me what you think about the trolley problem? <laughs> I'm like, totally out of left field. No. So, you know, uh, she, the student had been watching The Good Place and there's a really funny episode on that. But anyway, the second question the student asked me, it's just like, this, we have no relationship, right? Uh, and the student, do you believe in God? I'm just like they're really skipping the small talk. I know, man. <laughs> Getting right onto it. So I gave the student my standard pat response these days, which is, I believe that God exists, and I won't go any further than that because I don't know. I don't. I don't think that's agnosticism necessarily. Mm-mm. I do believe in an order. But how can I know God? I mean, one of the other things, you know, we might have talked about this episode was another trait is the fact that God is bodiless, right? Like God is not human. Even though we refer to God in the Western tradition with a male pronoun, uh, God does not have a body. Therefore, God does not have the plumbing, if you will, to know whether or not God is a man or a woman, because that category doesn't even exist for God. Like God is beyond that. Like, how am I even supposed to relate to that? And that's one of the arguments, you know, about existence of God and all that sort of stuff is that, you know, we anthropomorphize God to where we give him all these qualities of like God cares about us. God loves us. You know, all these things like how am I supposed to know God does that? By definition, God is so beyond my conception that I can only do kind of like what the end of the poem one in the Tao Te Ching says is know that God is a mystery wrapped within a mystery. And that in itself calls for admiration. But gosh, what can I do past that? And that gets us in all kinds of questions about divine revelation and you know how God is known to us. And I think that's all very interesting. But anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. No, I, I think I think it's a good response. So I I wanna I wanna give my swing at this one too, because I've been thinking about this one a little bit. And I think this might come from Swine, Swineburn, actually, but I'm not quite sure. I don't remember. I think this is an answer. I don't know if it's correct. I haven't really thought about it, but it's. I think it's where that, I think that God, if we hold these traits about God to be true, it seems likely that God would allow himself to be known in a way that humans mm. can know. And so I think that maybe one of these ways that humans can know about God is is thinking about God like a father. Maybe that's something that is just very identifiable for humans. I don't know. Uh, Catholics, I think this is a big point for Catholics, but I think Catholics believe that 
we can't know God fully. And I don't think any theist or most, most, I'm going to say most, hold myself to most uh, theists <laughs> uh, would think this. But I think Catholics think that we can know an extent to God that God allows us to know by our uh, ability to reason. And I think that's a very Catholic idea. I don't know. I don't know, though. But I think those are two of my swings at it. If I think that we're held to two positions on this idea, though, that like God is so unknowable from us, uh, I think it's either that we can't really know God at all, or God has allowed himself to be known to some extent. I think that's that's how it has to be. But it could be wrong. Yeah, no, I like that. Some good stuff to think about. I, you know, I do believe that God is rational, and I do believe that God is all good because I believe uh, earlier, like we were talking about, and really this is almost this is really platonic in a way, is that someone who is going to be all good and who is perfectly free would would do that, which is always good, mm. um, because at least as far as mm, well, I don't know if there's total evidence for that in human nature, but if you follow sort of the platonic ideal of moving towards the forms of good and, you know, perfectly good, perfectly beautiful, the good, the true, and the beautiful, God would ascend to be all truth. God is truth. Um, ooh, who was I reading the other day? Oh, it was Gandhi. I was reading mm. about Gandhi. Gandhi said, God is truth. But he reverses it and says, truth is God. Like, mm. you can't separate those two things. And so for a, a being that is truth, is truth, not knows truth, is truth, would, of course, be good and rational. Anyway, there, I've bared my soul. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I have anything else to add to that, but I think, <laughs> I think that's awesome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for going with us to some places, the inner dimensions of reality, talking about God today and the nature of it. We had a really great time. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have anything you'd like to add, anything you'd like to critique uh, from what we said, or just want to let us know really anything, you can email us at opendwarphilosophy at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. You can also interact with us on open door philosophy uh, on instagram or on twitter at d underscore parsonage mr parsons twitter and i think that's all but uh yeah we'd really love to hear from you whatever you might want to say i mean if we were to get comments on anything it would surely be the episodes about religion yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> oh boy we'd love to thank our good buddy kevin mcleod for the use of his free music which is so darn groovy we just sit here and like sort of weave our heads back and forth for a couple minutes after it's over. You guys never see it. It's really weird. <laughs> so we hope that you guys have a blessed week and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Remember, whenever your life is in need of some philosophy, the door is always open. See ya. Peace. Peace. <laughs>the lord's peace peace uh what is it uh, what's the greeting what can i think of the greeting peace be with you pox peace be with you and also with you i guess yeah the passing of the peace is that what they call it in catholic catholicism passing of the peace? i don't i don't think we call oh, it that's anything. a lutheran it's, we, 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 it's a lutheran thing i don't well we we do that but uh we don't call it anything i don't think uh but yeah yeah in my limited Lutheran experience, they're like, oh, now it's time for the passing of the peace. And they're like, uh, peace be with you and also with you. So <laughs> everyone funny. turns around and says it to each other. Yeah. We have nothing else to say. I think, <laughs> I think like when the pandemic started, at least at school, we would, I mean, I think some people would still shake each other's hands, but I think like a lot of people, I don't know if like anyone actually really like doing it i don't know maybe that's like really a, a sacrilegious thing but i never really well, liked the, it. the introvert i am yeah uh, always appreciated that i had a script <laughs> well i could at least say uh <laughs> that's like, funny just uh, peace be with you all right good let's move on <laughs> that's funny yeah some pe some people give hugs used to give hugs uh but now 
I think everybody just goes like the, the Nixon peace sign to each other. Mm. Uh, so I think that's funny. <laughs> the eye contact is also a thing. Like you make eye contact with the priest, you do a little head nod, uh, mm, and you call it a yes. call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay, we'll shut that thing down before we say anything else that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs>